My name is Kamil and I run the um, Valuing Diversity in Education for Society blog. As EEL coordinator, one of the things that I try to do on the blog is offer different kinds of strategies that mainstream teachers could use in their classrooms to remove the um, English language barrier that EEL learners might face. Um, but um, I realize that a lot of you might be um, reading and accessing those sort of um, blogs on the go. And so what I've decided to do is to essentially offer a video that would um, uh, that would have exactly the same content as the article uh, that's, uh, that you will see under it. In other words, you would be able to choose uh, uh, whether to watch a video or the actual article with images in it and would actually have the same content. And perhaps for some of you, that would be an easier thing to do and the easier thing to, um, to actually use. So this is um, the first of the videos in the series. One thing that is very easy to miss is that when teaching EL learners, we shouldn't just simplify making language, academic language more accessible to them, but also we need to ensure that they actually pick this academic language along the way. In other words, once we've simplified the language, use analogies, images or graphic organizers, we need to make sure that they learn the academic language they actually need. It is not good that a learner continues to use words like watch or see when really they should be using observe in science. It is not good that they keep using move when really it should be shift in geography. Before we move on to the actual strategies, some things need explaining. What you see here is based on the semantic waves research by Carl Mayton from Australia. He distinguishes semantic gravity, which is how much a word's meaning is related to its context. For instance, Naming an animal has a large gravity, and thus is SG+, in relation to talking about an event from history which is further removed from our immediate experience, making it SG-. However, that same event from history, when compared to talking about photosynthesis, is SG+, and the scientific concept SG-. The other concept Mayton talks about is that of semantic density, that is, how dense the, the meaning of a word is. For instance, gold, when taking the general non-scientific meaning of metal, has a weaker density, making it SD-, but it is SD+, when used in the field of chemistry in science. In other words, the density is greater when we use them for technical terms. So greater gravity and lesser density are less academic and more concrete uses of vocabulary, while smaller gravity and greater density, on the opposite, are more academic. As we talk in our classrooms, we don't just do one of these, but our talk fluctuates as we use technical terms first, and then use analogies, gestures, pictures, and other means to explain, make it SG plus and SD minus, concepts to our students. Speaking only academically would mean our students wouldn't be able to access the academic concepts we present them with. And speaking in only concrete, high gravity type, type terms wouldn't offer them the academic language they need either. We need to do the two. Unfortunately, when it comes to EAL learners, what you see here actually happens most often. We simplify, but don't take the time to offer them a way back to the academic language. This is what the strategies presented here are all about. How do we generate the ability to use formal, technical, academic language in our EAL learners? What we need to do is unpack the language first for them, and once they understand it, repack the academic, so next time they know it. And we can move further up, rather than let them linger using simplified concepts and not the formal language they need to be using. Here's an example from a lesson I had earlier this week, where I used uh, one of the EAL Nexus resources for science and adapted it. A lesson that was about the point at which water boils. First, the actual terminology and academic words were introduced and explained through the use of pictures and uh, the teacher, so myself, making analogies. For instance, gauze, tripod, Bunsen burner, flame, and beaker. 
there were also a number of verbs that needed explaining. For instance, poured, observed, lit, and measured. We are currently working on the past simple tense as relevant to different subjects, so my language focus was squarely on the past simple verbs, verbs here. The pictures and a simple group work where students needed to arrange the images in the correct order came first. Once that was out of the way, the students were presented with a simple matching exercise, which you can see on the screen now. Here, they needed to match the academic words to their simpler equivalents. Heated is made hotter, placed is put, and lit is started fire. What we are doing here is what the semantic wave theorists termed as unpacking. Here, we are dealing with just a few terms, this might have otherwise been helped with the use of the first language, but I felt we didn't need that here, as the pictures we had just used were enough uh, to understand what these words were. I followed this exercise by questioning students, asking them the, uh, to give me the equivalents for spoken-like non-academic words. So, for instance, the answer to put water in would be poured. Now that I felt the students had the understanding of these terms, we proceeded to repacking. That is, getting students to think back to using the academic terms. In my class, I have three sublevels, if you will, of students in terms of the le the, uh, their level of English language acquisition. The differentiated sheets you, are, uh, you, you see here have been designed for those three different levels of students. They are gap-filled clauses, but of varying levels of difficulty. All of them focus on changing the non-academic uh, words, verbs, to their harder academic formal equivalents. The lowest level, red, as you can see here, contains images and, and non-academic words, for example, watched or started fire, in brackets, next to the gaps, as well as the academic words needed in a box at the bottom of the page. Following this, the students need to write the sequence in which the instructions, these events, take place um, in the first column on the left. The orange, so middle level, gets a slightly different task. Here, as you can see, there is no box with words anymore, but the gaps have the first letter of the desired word. Like the lowest group, they need to sequence these sentences. The top group has only the easier words in brackets, no box and no first letter provided. Um, I, of course, work with, uh, 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 with an induction group of students, um, but in your mainstream settings, you could choose, of course, to remove the bracketed words entirely for your top group too, but the students would know they need to put in the academic verbs in the gaps. The students attempt attempted to fill in the gaps, which most of them did successfully, all done with books closed, and following this, checked their answers by going back to their books. They checked the sequence of sentences too. Now, we were almost ready to write. The orange and green levels were given this timeline first, and I asked them to place the connectives, connecting phrases, into the relevant categories of start, middle, and end first. The orange level, uh, so the middle level, was to write the phrases with connectives in. They were tasked to write eight sentences. There are eight sentences and event in the sequence, so they didn't need to write any compound or complex sentences. Rather, they just needed to determine which connectives are to be used at the start, in the middle, and at the end of their writing. The top, green level, however, was tasked to have maximum six sentences. This means that they needed to pair up certain sentences with the connectives when and or before. For instance, um, when we turned on the gas, we lit the Bunsen, bur uh, Bunsen burner with a wooden spill, or we turned on the gas before we lit the Bunsen burner with a wooden spill. If they paired two sets of sentences in this way, they'd get six sentences altogether. For the lowest level, I did something different in class that turned out to be far too easy. What I did resulted in them just copying off the previous exercise only reformatting it and turning it into a list of sentences without connectives. Not a good idea, but one learns from one's mistakes. In retrospect, I would do the following. As you can see, this is a substitution table, which allows one to generate several sentences by choosing different options from the columns, starting on the left and moving right. 
The sentences are mixed up, of course, to check if they understand the sequence of what happened in the experiment. It's the middle column that is truly important to us. These are the verbs. As it's the lowest level, they are provided for them, but clearly the learners need to remember what they mean now in order to pick the correct one to write the correct sentences. The students need to generate a list of sentences in the correct order, but unlike the higher levels, they do not need to use any connectives yet.